And welcome to Viewpoint. I'm Joe Paris, filling in for Doug Petcash this week. The general election is fast approaching, coming up on Tuesday, November 8th. Last week and, and this week on Viewpoint, we're focusing on one of the big races in Idaho, the race for United States Senate between Republican Senator Mike Crapo and his Democratic challenger, David Roth. Now, Senator Crapo was our guest last Sunday. We discussed some of his priorities, some of the big issues of the day, including the economy and inflation and abortion, health care for veterans, his recent votes on major bills, and why he's running for a fifth term. And you can watch the full interview on KTVB.com and the KTVB YouTube channel. Today, it is Democrat David Roth's turn to lay out his priorities and stances on the big issues and explain why he's running for the Senate. Mr. Roth grew up in Idaho Falls. He is the executive director of the Bonneville Youth Development Council, which he works to reduce substance use among youth. He also serves on the board of the Idaho Falls affiliate of Habitat for Humanity and the Idaho Falls Soup Kitchen and has served as chair of the Bonneville County Democrats. Mr. Roth is the father of two sons that he adopted after being their foster parent. And on his campaign website, he defines himself as a Christian, a father, a Democrat, an out gay man, a community leader, a son, a brother, and a candidate for United States Senate. And we don't just have pictures. Oh, no, we have David Roth in person with us here today. And thank you so much for joining us here on Viewpoint. Uh, we'll start with this. Why are you running for, uh, running for United States Senate? It's a big run. It is a big run. And, and first of all, I appreciate you having me here. You know, I think the number one reason that I'm running for U.S. Senate is over the last several years, I've looked at what's happening in our country and in our state, and it's just not working. I mean, we have had 30 years of Republican super control of our state, and yet over 40% of our population is not making ends meet. Um, we have rising costs across the board, um, and though we have low unemployment, those jobs just simply aren't paying enough. There's so many other issues out there when you look at protecting our republic, protecting our democracy, and I just felt that it was the time to take a stand. And it's not your first time running for office. Back in the year 2020, you ran for the uh, Idaho legislature. You didn't win that race, but why are you running for a higher race this time? Did you feel that your run for the legislature, you know, kind of warmed you up for a bigger office? No, you know, honestly, it does. Um, when you're in a state like Idaho, we don't have a whole lot of Democrats on the bench, and so, when it comes time to like who's going to who's going to step up to do this who who has the passion to do it um, and I, I just looked around and looked at the options and I said I thought that I could do this and I think that the electorate is different now I think that the issues are different and I think that it's it's a time that people are looking for a change and so I actually had the only competitive Democratic primary statewide. Um, where there was two names on the ballot to choose from, and, and I won. And so I think that shows that the people of Idaho are ready for a change. And you're not new to politics. Uh, you, you started you know, several years ago, and mm -hmm. in 2006 is when you really jumped into it. Why did you get into politics in 2006? So I really I got into politics because, once again, I think that I'm sort of a problem solver person. That's why I started working with foster kids, and that's why I ended up adopting my children from foster care, is... When I see an issue that, that needs addressed and no one is addressing it, I want to get right in there and get in the middle of it. And so um, it's one of the reasons I serve on so many boards. You know, you, you have to get involved. And speaking of one of those boards, one of those organizations, as we mentioned, you're the executive director for the Bonneville Youth Development Council. What does that council do? What, what are you working on over there? So we are primarily a, a coalition in our community, and we work to try to create opportunities uh, to, to prevent substance use among youth. So we do a lot of in-school programming. Um, we teach an anti-vaping program in middle schools and in elementary schools. And we also do a lot with parents. Um, drugs are different now than they were years ago. You know, you, you talk to a lot of parents and they're like, oh, my kids don't do drugs. I don't see any of the, of the paraphernalia or the signs. But drugs today are different. Um, there's a lot of drugs that are vaped. There's a lot of pills, um, different things that we have. And so we actually do what we call a drug trends education class, where we actually work with parents. We talk about the current drug trends. We have a trailer, a 16-foot trailer, that's been set up to look like a teenage bedroom. And so we have the parents, we, we teach them what to look for, and then we go out into the trailer and let them put those skills to work. And many are really surprised um, about things that never really occurred to them. 
you adopted your two boys in 2017 after being their foster dad, um, and it puts you in a unique lens because in Idaho, there's a lot of conversation about foster care and adoption. Um, how do you feel about the job that the Idaho foster care system is doing, and do you think that at a federal level, if elected, you could help improve that in Idaho? Yeah, I mean, honestly, the... I think every foster agency out there is really just doing the best that they can with the resources that they have. The foster community is, is an often forgotten and overlooked underserved community. These are children who are generally, um, they come from households that are not priority households uh, in our country. They're not uh, you know, high on lists of politicians. They're not big donors. They're not big voters even. And so foster care tends to be one of those areas that's it's sort of a necessary evil and um, that people view it as, I don't, you know. And, and so because of that, there's always a lack of funding and that honestly is what the biggest problem is. We don't have the funding and the resources to keep up with it. We don't have the funding and the resources to uh, unify more families because there's a lot of work that goes into a reunification with a family. You've got to solve the problems and make sure that those problems are not gonna happen again. That's expensive, it takes a lot of time and effort. And it's a really, really thankless job. And so you see a really high turnover, uh, thankless job, low pay equals high turnover. Um, and so you'll see a lot of people who will come into the system um, as staff or caseworkers with the absolute best of intentions. I met a woman the other day who's been a caseworker in foster care for like 30 years, which is a miracle. My hat is off to her because it's a really, really emotionally draining job, and we do not give these people enough credit. And these are the people in our community, often kids in foster care will age out. I, ad I adopted children and were sibling group. They were older. Um, they were actually in the process of being split up um, because the younger one uh, family that was gonna move to Texas had shown interest in the younger one, and their view was, well, it's better to get one out of the system, and so they were gonna split them up. Um, and, and I was able to step in and say, no, I'll, I'll take them both. But the challenge is there are so many kids in our system um, and they're there for a myriad of reasons. And if we don't support them, and a lot of this comes from the federal level, it comes from block grants that are supporting foster care, it comes from Medicaid money who pays for all of the health and the counseling, those types of things. We need to make those investments in these children because if we don't, they have a high likelihood of not graduating from high school, they have a high likelihood of being homeless, they have a high likelihood of turning to drugs or turning to human trafficking. Um, there's, there's a plethora of reasons why it's important to focus on these kids when they're young. And so it's definitely a place we should be making more investments. It sounds like based on your answer, you know, this is probably a topic you know, a top topic for you in terms of priorities. If elected, you know, is this something that you think you could really involve yourself in, in, in the sense that you have a unique lens here, and as you just spoke on, you have a lot of experience working through the system. I mean, I, I feel like that would be able to be conducive to create change, if, you know, if that's a priority. Oh, absolutely, and I think that when you look at it overall, I think that one of the biggest areas that we should have in government is the next generations, is our youth, and whether it's foster care, whether it's education, whether it's higher education, whether it's food for kids in schools. All of these issues, if we don't build up those kids now, it's too late by the time that they're adults. It's too late by the time that they can vote. Um, we need to give them a really strong foundation now. I look at my own growing up and the foundation that I received, and, and I came from what a lot of people would view as challenge. I, my mother was a single mother. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was very, very young. And my mother worked full time. In fact, often she had three jobs. And so sort of every excuse that I could have had to, to have not turned out well, if I can say that I've turned out well, but because of the foundation that my, parent, my mother put in place and my father too, and, and because of my grandparents and the community support and even our church support and, and schools and teachers and all of those things, all those people that were there, they filled in and they gave me that foundation. And if you look at where we're at now, we have a severely underfunded education system. We're like 51st in the nation. And we're not giving those kids that same foundation that we had. We're not giving them the same opportunities. And it's a very, it's, it's essentially like deferred maintenance. If we're not spending the money and we're not making the investment now, thinking, well, they can figure it out when they get older. But the reality is they won't. And then we're just creating a bigger problem for the future. David Roth. 
candidate for United States Senate joining us here this morning on Viewpoint. We're going to step aside, but when we come back, we're going to dive into some of the big issues, including abortion, inflation, and much more. Don't go anywhere. Viewpoint returns right after this. And welcome back to Viewpoint this morning. We're sitting down with David Roth, a candidate for United States Senate here from the state of Idaho. And let's jump into some of the big topics. I want to go to your website here. On your website, you wrote this, quote, Today I worry that the fall of certain legal precedents could tear my family apart. My ability to provide for my family could be in jeopardy. I'm not the only one who has these worries. We're facing a rollback of rights, and it's all about what labels we have and who extremists and their allies in leadership positions are targeting and scapegoating. No one should have to face these decisions. Now, this is a very conservative state, and we know that. And as an openly gay man in the state of Idaho, and really some of the, the recent headlines here, as a member of the LGBTQ plus community, how, I guess, acutely sensitive or acutely aware are you to these issues in Idaho? And as a gay man, how do you think you're positioned to address some of these things, like extremely violent uh, rhetoric against the LGBT community here? Yeah, I mean, speaking specifically to the precedents I'm concerned about, in the Dobbs decision, in his concurring opinion, Justice Thomas basically laid out a laundry list of cases that he wants to see. He wants to see the end of contraception. He wants to see the end of same-sex marriage. He wants to see the end, uh, he wants to recriminalize being gay. And I worry, when I adopted my children, single family, uh, single parent adoption, um, or adoption by an openly gay person was, was a fairly new thing. Um, and so, I worry that as those precedents get rolled back, my family may or may not be okay. It kind of depends on how they decide to roll it back, but certainly other opportunities. And as we mentioned before, there are so many kids in the system already, other opportunities could be jeopardized. Here in Idaho specifically, yeah, we do face a tremendous amount. You have religious leaders here calling for the execution of the LGBT population. You have sitting state legislators supporting that, going to those rallies, calling that out. You have the leader of the Idaho Gen uh, GOP specifically calling out just in the last couple of days attacking the Pride Festival here in Boise. And I think that it's really important now more than ever that we stand up and we be visible. As far as I know, I'm only the second openly gay man ever nominated to the US Senate by a major party. So it's a huge accomplishment that we've been able to do this, especially in a state like Idaho. And I feel like it sends a message. Um, I get letters and emails and cards from people all across this country. Um, I received an, an email back in June about a family who had a 14-year-old trans son who's been in the hospital. Um, sorry, I received it in June. He'd been in the hospital four times since January with credible suicide threats. And they said that my candidacy was such an uplifting thing and an inspiration that they felt that, or he felt that if I could get here in the state that I am, and if I'm willing to stand up, then why couldn't he continue to stand up and fight along? And I get letters like that all the time. We've seen such a tremendous outpouring of support of where people are ready to stand up against this. They don't like it. Idaho is not a state that's about hate. And it's not a state where we're gonna target one group of people and say, you're wrong or you're bad. Um, we, have, we have campaign buttons and we have two styles. We have like a traditional blue style and then we have a rainbow style. And when I originally ordered, I ordered twice as many of the traditional blue style as I did of the rainbow style. We've had to reorder the rainbow ones about four times. I think there's over 3,000 of them floating around out there. The blue ones were still on the first order. So people are very excited about this. I think that you know, we do face, um, talking during the break, about uh, social media, and I, I do face a tremendous amount of backlash on social media, but it's a tremendous amount of backlash from a few vocal people, and I think that it just goes to show that they're basing this on hate, and when you look at what's happening in our country, when you look at the ruling out of a Texas judge yesterday that said, you know what, you no longer, insurance companies no longer have to pay for HIV medications because it might violate the religious beliefs of the owner of the company. This type of targeting is just the beginning, and we're seeing this rollback of rights, whether it's women's rights, whether it's LGBT rights, we're seeing it across the country, and this is not what America's about, and it's certainly not what Idaho's about. 
And we've seen in the legislature a man like Representative John McCrossey stand up and you know be very vocal and very visible about LGBTQ uh, issues, something that I think some lawmakers might not be especially in tuned with. I think they're aware of it, but I don't know how you know in depth they know about it. Do you think you'd find yourself in a situation like Representative McCrossey of being someone that, <coughs> excuse me, could stand up and be this beacon of, okay, I'm going to be this resource and I have this lived experience? Exactly. I mean, I think about the the controversy right now over the Pride Festival and, and a sponsor pulling out, and what they're upset about is that we're starting to be more accepting of children who want to express these views, and they're saying, oh no, no, that's wrong. We can't indoctrinate children. But you're not really realizing what it's like to be an LGBT youth, especially in a conservative community. I mean, I grew up in a very conservative uh, church, and to have those feelings and have that worry of knowing that you're different and being afraid to tell people, and, and honestly, I don't know why I was afraid to tell people. My family's been extremely accepting. But as someone who's 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, to, for people to stand back and say, oh no, the kids, they don't have those feelings yet. Yeah, you do. And you just don't know that you have those because you've not lived that experience. And so when you're there and you're trying to say, you know what, I feel different and I don't know why. And I'm afraid that if I tell people that I feel different, people are not going to accept me. I'm going to be rejected. And so it's so important to stand up and share that experience because you can't stand on one side and say, oh, this is how a child feels when you haven't been that child and you don't know. So it's so important to show that acceptance. And I would agree there's appropriate ways and inappropriate ways to do it, but I think that as a community, we're working forward and trying to be as open and accepting as we can. And, and I think that we need to see more of that. If we want to reduce the number of LGBT kids who are committing suicide, um, and we want to have them have healthier relationships where they're not having to feel like they have to hide those feelings or do things in secret, I think in the end, we will just see a better community. We will see these children have better lives. They'll be able to focus on their schooling and on other things because they won't have this huge cloud hanging over them. So I think it's extremely important to stand up and share that experience. The father of <coughs> two adopted sons, and um, very interesting to me because uh, a conversation with the overturn of abortion rights and the Roe v. Wade, the Dobbs-Jackson decision, was about you know the foster care system. Um, as a father of two adopted children, what are your thoughts on the foster care system and adoption in terms of abortion rights? There have been some that say, okay, well, if we're going to outlaw abortion, you're going to need to really invest in, in the adoption system, in the foster care system. Where does that, I guess, put you? Do you feel in a unique position here? Well, first of all, I think that you're kind of almost looking at two issues. Yes, as I said before, we need to be investing more in foster care and adoption. There are tens of thousands of kids in this country right now waiting for families, and there are not tens of thousands of families lining up to adopt them. So to say that adoption is an option, mm, not really true, because there already are a ton of kids in the system waiting for adoption. Also keep in mind that most people, when they're adopting, uh, and this is a huge problem in the foster care system, they want infants, and they want infants that are coming from you know, healthy families, not problematic from good, uh, you know, they want the best possible outcome that they can have. When you're looking at a lot of these people who are seeking these abortions right now, those kids are not necessarily going to be that situation. You're going to have, you know, oftentimes uh, young mothers. You're going to have oftentimes mothers who are in poverty. You know, you're going to have a lot of, there's a disproportionate amount based on race. And I hate to say it, but there is just a certain child that people in this country want to adopt. And those kids are not going to fall into that category. That's one issue. The other issue is, though, the bigger issue with abortion is that we should not be infringing on a woman's right or an individual's right to choose how they use their own body. And that's, I think, what the really bigger issue is. So I don't like getting into the argument of using adoption or foster care as an alternative to abortion because I really feel like they're two separate things. And I feel like that's really discounting the kids that are in foster care because they're in foster care for a completely different reason. Uh, if elected, you'd be serving on the federal level. What are your thoughts on the federal intervention into Idaho's abortion laws? Did you agree with what the Justice Department did? I do, because the Idaho abortion laws, as they stand now, there's really, there's no exceptions. There's what are called affirmative defenses. So that means, let's pretend that you're a doctor and you have a woman who comes into your emergency room and she's got an ectopic pregnancy. Now, you have a choice that you make. You can go ahead and perform the abortion, save her life, but 
under the Idaho law, you could be charged criminally for it. Now, you'd go to court, and a judge and a jury would decide, and a judge and a jury who likely did not go to medical school, was likely not there, did not likely see the reports, didn't have to make the life or death decision that you made, are going to decide whether or not the woman's life was really in danger and whether or not there was another alternative. And so that's really where you run into the problem because what's gonna happen is you as a doctor are gonna come back and say, I'm not gonna take that risk. I mean, look at how expensive malpractice insurance already is. Imagine now we're putting criminal on top of it. Why would you take that risk? Because if you let her die, there's absolutely no downside to, her, to you. You just say, well, you know, my hands were tied. I wasn't sure that it was a life or death situation until she was dead, and then I was pretty sure it was life and death. But that's not what this is about. So the federal lawsuit going back in and creating that exception um, is what the Idaho law should have done if they were gonna pass this draconian law, is what they should have done in the first place, is, is made that exception that says, in the case of the mother, there, uh, of the life of the mother, there is no criminal prosecution. It simply is up to the judgment of the doctor who's there in the situation. Do you want a surgeon who's, who's operating on you to be talking to his lawyer before he makes any incisions? No. You want them to move as quickly as possible to save your life. We're joined this morning on Viewpoint by David Roth, candidate for United States Senate. We are going to step aside, but when we come back, we're going to talk with Mr. Roth about his top priority heading into the election, plus a major topic, inflation. David Roth joining us here on Viewpoint, running for United States Senate. Mr. Roth, thank you so much for your time this morning. Before we wrap up, we wanted to end with this. What is your top priority heading into the election? My top priority has got to be protecting those individual freedoms, whether it's the individual freedom to choose your bodily autonomy, what to do with your body, whether it's the freedom to choose whether or not to have con use contraception, whether or not it's the freedom to marry or love whoever you want to love. Those individual freedoms... Oh, actually, individual freedom includes your voting rights as well. Those individual freedoms have got to be our top priority, and I think that we're seeing across the nation, that's the number one thing that voters are concerned about right now. They're watching these hard-won rights be stripped away, and they're saying no. We saw it in Kansas. We saw it in Alaska. The pushback is protecting those individual freedoms. We want to make sure that in America we are still free to be the people that we want to be and we need to, we hear often that we, it's being, it, the, the rights are not being taken away, they're being pushed back to the states. And I'm not opposed to states' rights. I think states' rights have a very important role in our government. However, I think that when you come to what defines being an American, what defines being a citizen in this country, what defines being a person in this country, those rights are not a state's right. Those have to be the same no matter where you are. Right now in the state of Idaho, if you drive an hour west of here and you're a woman, you have a different right there than you do here. That's not how a country works. We don't, our rights don't change as we pass from state to state, the rights that define who we are as an individual. If the Oberfeld decision was overturned, um, and let's say I ever happened to get married, um, it's not that I'm married in one state and as soon as I cross over into another state, I'm all of a sudden not married anymore. It doesn't work th that way. So when it comes to states' rights, I understand there's a place for those states' rights, but when it comes to what it means to be an American, what rights are so fundamental, so inalienable to us, those rights have to be decided and protected at the federal level because they have to be the same everywhere you go. Um, imagine if you were traveling with your family and you went into another state and were in some sort of accident and all of a sudden, well, in that state, your family doesn't have the rights to do, uh, to make those decisions for you. So definitely that would be my top priority. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Of course, you can learn more about Mr. Roth. We're going to have a link in this story on KTVB.com that'll go to his campaign site. You can read more about his bio and more about his priorities. Um, we weren't able to dive into everything, you know, in our short program here today, but uh, viewers can learn more about you on our website at KTVB.com. Thank you so much for your time today. We super duper appreciate it. And we will be following this race as we get closer to the November 8th election. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Viewpoint. You can always learn more about election season at KTVB.com. If you ever miss Viewpoint, you can catch it on KTVB or on the KTVB YouTube channel. We'll see you next time.